kudos to her and applauds and uh, for just coming with um, to our team in August. Um, she's done a stellar job and I couldn't have done this without her. So very appreciative for all your work. And uh, I will be mentioning her in the in about three or four slides. And so she's gonna be a key contact this weekend for you guys. Uh, also Connie Ingberg and many of you uh, are familiar with Connie. She's been with us for a few years. Um, uh, helping out and she has been responsible for sending you your rockets. Now, with that being said, I know that uh, there might be one or two that didn't get everything or maybe even to get, didn't get their rocket. We hope that you stay. Um, your rocket should be coming and it's our apologies. We sent them out um, and anticipated that everybody would have them. Um, so Connie is your key person um, throughout the launch cycle and throughout the, the competition. Um, and she'll be with us tonight and in the morning um, uh, to take attendance and things like that as well. Triple E, uh, Frank Noble, you all have worked with him and we are so grateful for all of the work that he has done over the years to help this program be as, as phenomenal as it is. Uh, he will be leading most of the presentations tonight. And um, you know, if you have questions, you'll raise your hand, chat in the box um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer that for you. Bob Justice, um, Illinois Triple E assistant and with First Nations launch uh, right along with Frank right from the get go. And we greatly um, uh, appreciate that. Uh, he has been with us and such a strong supporter and we value all of the knowledge that he has. Uh, Glenn, I see your chat and we are recording this. And so um, we will make it available to you. Kevin Harnick. Um, Kevin, you've been unofficially with us uh, for several years, but officially with us the last couple of years. And um, he's usually the gentleman that you're going to see out at the launch pad and making sure your rockets are going off. So tonight he will be joining us, um, Wisconsin Triple E, and he will be uh, giving us those up close shots so that you know exactly what's going on um, each step of the way. And so hopefully he's gonna have everything up close, clear and uh, make it real simple for you folks. What I'm really excited about, and uh, hopefully this is a testament to, to for you all in the future. And that is, uh, do wanna welcome back Trent Cybella um, and Jane Denali, both are our CRL alumni. Uh, they participated with UW Platteville uh, throughout the past several years. Um, Trent went on uh, to work at Sierra Nevada Corporation, and Jane is a kindergarten teacher and bringing STEM to young children so that hopefully they'll grow up and be like us into rockets. Um, so really appreciate the two of them giving back to the program that supported them throughout their undergraduate. So what I'd love right now is um, we're just gonna take a, a few minutes and have everybody introduce themselves um, so that we know who's gonna be um, on this uh, workshop on the, on the Zoom calls for the next day and a half. And with that being said, I'm gonna call on you. And when I do, I would greatly appreciate it if you could um, just, like I said, 30 seconds, tell us who you are, what school you go to, what rocket experience that you have, um, and maybe what what a goal, some of the goals and expectations you have for the workshop. All right, so with that being said, Matthew Strange, you're up first. Hi, I'm, I'm Matthew Stungy. I'm with uh, UW River Falls. Um, uh, I haven't really had much rocket experience, uh, except for uh, one, uh, summer I, I spent like a day working with a guy who uh it, um built his own rockets not high powered rockets but um uh, so, so it was kind of cool to build build a rocket um uh for the the workshop i, I don't know just just learn more, more about how po high powered rockets and uh, uh maybe also understand how the um Roxim, uh software works a little bit better very good, thank you, Matthew. Dr. Farrow. Everybody should know you, but I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. So, uh, Dr. Farrow, I teach mechanical engineering at MSOE and have done that for a long time. 
I've got a long association with Space Grant, um, stemming way back into the 1990s when it was just becoming a thing um, and it helping me out in my graduate studies. So since I've gone on to help bring this, um, the CRL, the Collegiate Rocket Launch Competition into being and has, have continued to act as the, the coordinator director for that program. I have another program in Space Grant, the Elijah Balloon um, Payload Team, which is a summer internship opportunity for students, especially for, for sophomores and um, freshmen that are looking for that first aerospace type internship to jump on board for, for the summer. Um, so we're recruiting right now, go to this the Space Grant webpage. I think the recruiting is open for about two more weeks. So, oh yeah, this is a plug. Um, but why am I here? Because I've never built a high powered rocket, let alone uh, been certified at any level. So all I've built are um, Estes engine powered type rockets up through D level. So the ones that are go high enough to get lost in a neighborhood and that's about it. Um, so I've been, been kind of badgered for years and I've never had the time to dedicate to it. And so this time with the workshop right here, first time around for CRL, I'm like, I can't refuse this opportunity. So here I am, show me how to build a rocket. And we're really excited because he's the last person on our team to get his level one certification. And so um, after this weekend, every person that we have introduced has their level one or higher um, rocket certification. So we have a great team supporting this program. All right, next, Addison. Yeah, hi, I'm Addison Kopleen. I'm an ME sophomore at MSOE. I'm the team lead for our rocket team this year for CRL. Uh, I don't have any rocket experience. Last year would have been my first competition, but that obviously didn't work out. Excellent. Thank you. Andrew. Hi there. I'm Andrew. I'm a, a sophomore currently at UW Milwaukee uh, going into electrical engineering. I, uh, I, I've got two kiddos, so a lot of my experience with rockets have, is like uh, Dr. Farrow. It's it's a uh, SDs, uh, hobby rockets, and everything like that. Just shooting them off with them, trying to get them interested. Um, and kind of what I'm looking to get out of this is just kind of just a uh, place to start off for high power rocketry, and uh, just learn a big overview of uh, of everything that it has to offer. So. Very good. Uh, I'm excited to meet uh, Drag because uh, you've been doing, you've been along with us for a long time, but I've never had the opportunity to meet you. Yeah, I'm the one that's always late uh, uh, for the <laughs> deadline. So uh, now that we're a person, I apologize for that. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I didn't, I didn't bring that up. <laughs> uh, but I'm a, a professor uh, at Marquette University in mechanical engineering. I teach the mechanics courses, uh, statics, dynamics, mechanics and materials, design of machine elements. Uh, I, this is, I think, the f maybe fourth time that that I'm uh, mentoring a team, but I've never had uh, the 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 uh, chance to actually build with the teams. Uh, I've been more like you know man managerial type uh, position, so I'm really looking forward to to actually building it. And I'm glad that uh, you guys put this together so that we actually have to individually build. Uh, so you, I think that's the best way to, to learn about rockets. So uh, I'm really looking forward. The only experience I have uh, uh, with actual rockets is Estes rockets, but we're talking like when I was a little kid. So <laughs> way, way back when, when Bill and I were little kids, probably. They were steam powered back then. Hey, 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 guys. Okay, we're going to keep going because I've got to get through and I've got about 10 more slides before 6.30. Guess we've got to stay on schedule. So um, next, um, Glenn. Hi, Glenn Spizak, physics professor at UW River Falls. 
and I've mentored teams for, for many, many years. I've not built one from scratch, start to finish, but lots of pieces. So thought it would be, thought it would be good. Well, welcome, Glenn. We're glad to have you here. And um, yeah, uh, nice to see you. Um, all Hi. right, uh, next, James. All right, I don't usually use Zoom. Um, my name is Jimmy. Uh, I, am an MBA at, I am a junior MBA at Marquette University. Uh, I have been building rockets for this competition or for the WSGC competition for the last two years. I uh, started out as a team member my first year and I led the team um, the following year. Uh, I mainly doing this workshop so I can get my level one certification so I can get my level two certification and I'm always happy to build rockets. So here I am. Excellent. Well we're glad to have you. Um, next is going to be um, Jordan and then Dylan be ready to come on right after him. Hi. Hang on. I'll get this video thing. There we go. Maybe. Well, hi, my name is Jordan. I am a senior technically at UWGB. Um, currently, I'm majoring in mechanical engineering. Uh, we'll see what all shakes up as far as school is concerned next year. Um, I have no rocketry experience whatsoever. I think when I was a kid, I did some of those like, you know, pump them up with a tire pump and then shoot them off into the sky rockets, but that's about it. So what I'm really hoping to gain from tonight is just to get a better understanding of what all we're doing so that way I can, you know, contribute a little more to the team and yeah, know a little bit more about what we're doing. Very good. All right, Dylan, you're up with Oh, who's going to be after him? Uh, uh, my name is Dylan. I go to UW Sheboygan. Uh, this is I'm a sophomore. This is actually my first ever rocket team. I did like a model rocket kit in high school, but that is it. And my goal is to just, I just want to learn about rockets and about main functions and just the general knowledge since I don't really know much. Perfect. Thank you. Brian. Hello, my name is Brian Welsh. I'm a physics professor at UWGB. Um, I'll take off my mask so people can see me. If you ever see me outside, you know what I look like. Um, I'm here with Jordan and uh, Jordan is a team member of ours. And then we also have our team lead, Elizabeth Heinen, who's uh, working elsewhere. Um, I have mentored teams. That I think this might have been my, kind of losing track here, fourth or fifth year. Last year was kind of abortive. So we have an airframe from last year that never launched, but um, I've never built one from start to finish and I'm not certified in anything. So I'm sort of a, in a similar boat to Glenn. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, you know, doing it from one end to the other and the certification will help too. So we can launch independently of a uh, space grant if we want to. Perfect. Uh, next will be Bill Dirienzo with Elizabeth on deck. Hey everybody, uh, Bill Dirienzo. I'm a, also a physics professor at uh, Green Bay, but I'm based at the Sheboygan campus primarily. Um, so here with Dylan. Uh, I've been the faculty advisor for our rocket team for several years now, but I've mostly been hands off uh, with the actual rocket once we get past the S this stage. Because uh, we have a really good technical advisor most years, but I like to be able to answer my team's technical questions uh, between meetings with him. So, thank you. Very good. Elizabeth with Ian on deck. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. I am a student in the mechanical engineering department at UN. UW Green Bay, and I'm a junior. I've been in Rocket Club since freshman year, and I'm excited to build a rocket the whole way through and to get my certification. Perfect. Um, Ian, right, with I'm, Max on. I'm a chemistry student at uh, UWRF. I'm looking to transfer to Duluth after, so I'll have my chemistry degree and chemical engineering degree, and so I thought this was a great opportunity to do some engineering possibly, but, and also maybe I'll wanna go for aerospace engineering or something, that would be cool. So, yeah, thank you. And Max. I'm a junior computer engineer at UW-Milwaukee. I've only ever done rocket kits like in high school, and I'm hoping to get my certification and build a rocket from start to finish. Excellent, did I miss anybody? 
Okay, I think I got everybody. All right, so thank you everybody for joining us. We're really excited to have you and really excited about the weekend and uh, getting you filled through the build process. We'll tell you a little bit more about the certification process tomorrow afternoon. Um, but like I said, we are very excited. So a couple of notes. So as we go through the PowerPoint presentation, you're gonna notice that the pages um, will be highlighted a different color. And so this will be for your reference uh, after the program as much as during the program. So if you are looking at a blue screen, we're gonna be going over the overview, um, rocketry overview and fundamental. When we're in green, we're building. So green for go, gray, is rock sim simulations, the, those areas that I heard many of you saying, hey, I cannot wait to learn more about rock sim. Those gray slides are gonna be the slides that you wanna focus on. Um, and competition support, uh, project management, and I just noticed this, um, we have, due to the timeline, we have uh, removed the project management for this particular weekend. Um, just to make sure we can get through each piece. However, there will be other areas, I believe, that are highlighted yellow. And if you get lost at all during the presentation, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you're going to have a handbook reference um, so you can follow along with your handbook. Thank you for reminding me of that. All right, next screen. So looking at our schedule, and what we're gonna be doing. So tonight, um, pretty much an overview for the very beginning. We're gonna make sure that your rocket kits are complete and that you have um, all the pieces and we're gonna begin fitting those together. And we will begin working with epoxy tonight. Uh, we have one uh, step that needs to be completed before the morning. And so we're hoping to get through all of that this evening. Tomorrow, we'll go through the complete build. Now, when you come in the morning, make sure you have water, maybe some snacks. It's a full day and we had to trim down some of your breaks um, just to be able to get through everything in this condensed uh, timeline. We've, we've trimmed three hours off of our uh, workshop schedule in order to be able to bring this to you. So be prepared, be ready, but we're gonna go through the whole process and I know you guys are gonna have a great time. And so 10, 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, and it, as uh, the band teachers used to say, to be on time is to be late, to be early is to be on time. And that's what we're hoping that all of you folks will be there on time. Go ahead. So what are our expectations? First of all, you all know that we're working with Zoom. And so Danielle is our moderator. She's gonna help you with any of the technical difficulties that you might have. Um, we want you all to keep your cameras on and your videos on. Um, during the build and during the conversation because we have moderators that are kind of going through the screens to make sure that you guys are on task and on schedule and if, um, you know, to kind of be able to notice if you're having some struggles or maybe not getting something or you need some help. And the only way we can do this in the virtual world is by seeing you. So please, please, please keep those cameras on unless for some reason, you know, you, something major is going on in the background and it's gonna be a distraction, but we'd really like you to keep it on if you need to step away for any reason. Um, if you need help, please ask. This is a, you know, as much as we're far apart, we want this to be interactive. So as all of you've been on um, the virtual platforms, you know, you can raise your hand. I've already seen somebody do that. Um, you can give us reactions. You can tell us, hey, can you speed this up? Can you slow down? You know, those kind of things. Um, but also if you have a question, don't be afraid to, to put it in the chat. I know Jane, uh, Trent, myself, we're gonna be doing our best to keep up with all of your questions and answer them. And then also, you know, there's gonna be times where we can just have a conversation like we are, uh, you know, back and forth. So keep your audio muted when you are not, when we're going through the overviews. So um, when we do the, those components and we'll be doing like um, uh, propulsion overview or propulsion overview, stability overview, those are the times you're gonna wanna stay muted. But when we're doing the build process, free to have your mic open during those times. We'll be all together. And then after we go through certain steps, we're gonna go into a breakout and we have divided the group up into four groups. And so um, Frank's, 
Frank and Jane are going to be in a room. Bob and Trent are going to be in a room. Or are we three rooms? We're three rooms. And um, Kevin and myself will be in the third room. You'll have a specific breakout room that you'll go to each time. And so you just want to make sure you get to that room and we're there to help you. Your handbook, I hope you have it out. Um, you'll see on the bottom of the page, as, she, as Danielle said, we've got the references. Please, it should be right in order, except for a couple of spots because we had a last minute change, but pretty much it is going to be going through the workbook step by step. Sections one through 12 are the overview. Section 13 is the build process. So you will have to go back and forth just a tad bit, but that will um, help you to know where things are. Take notes, there's note sections. Take notes and um, so you know what's going on. And then Roxim, all of you should have been provided your key um, so that you could download that and have access to it. If you're having any problems with that, please put in the chat. Um, uh, a note and then Connie be, um, will be able to assist you, I believe, if you need help. So we will walk you through the process, the build process. You are, com you are encouraged to um, complete this in real time, right? Uh, go right along with us. If for any reason that you, you fall a little bit behind, we have those breakout rooms tonight. You can hopefully get caught up if you get behind, but uh, stick right with us and I um, think we got it all. So workshop materials. You guys have this list in your, in, your, um, in your handbooks and that is on page eight. Hopefully you have everything. If for any reason anything is missing, please, please, please set it in the chat so we can try and uh, figure out if there's a way to work around that. Um, and I think Danielle did a great job. She told you, you know, your, your little screws and your things like that, put those in the little um, Dixie cups that we'd sent you so that you have them. And then we will be um, telling you how to use everything um, as needed. You should have your rocket, rock sim, computer, handbook, and your supplies. Next. So what are our objectives? You are gonna walk away with, you are gonna be you know the design, build, fly concepts. Um, that's what this rocket program is all about. And so you're going to get it firsthand. And um, the one thing I do want you to remember, this is introductory. It is on a condensed timeline and we do not have enough timeline to get through everything. And so we're giving, doing our best to get you through the main points and, and the biggest um, steps so that you can hopefully even go on and get a level two down the road. And so we're going to be building a, a single deploy rocket kit. And, we, and the kit is called the Lock Precision uh, Caliber ISP kit. So you are gonna be building the same kit, every one of you. You also will be using the same motor. There will be no variations on the certification rocket. When you do this on your own, you're free to do what you'd like. And even on your second build, you can do what you like. Um, we will try and show you the difference between single and dual deploy. And uh, just to give you those references, and then we'll give you a basic understanding of RockSim and that flight simulation so that you'll be able to turn in your um, reports with RockSim and you'll know how to use it to, for the, the greatest effect. And you don't, won't go out and buy things for your competition rocket that will end up being um, not uh, helpful in the end and you won't be able to use it. So you'll run your simulations and then you'll make your purchases. And lastly, we want you to understand what it means to have your level one certification and what that process is and how to complete it after the workshop. Next. CRL, um, if you haven't gone there already, please do so. Um, on the website, you're gonna find everything you need to know about the competition. We also have our tools and tips page and there is a section, you have to scroll a little bit down, um, but you will find all of the resources that you need from vendors to context to safety, general resources, the whole nine yards. Next. And so high power rocketry, it began all the way back in 1957, way before I was born and some of the other folks in the room, some people were alive. Um, the first rocket manual for amateurs came out in 1960. So somebody would have to be 60 years old um, uh, for the, when that came out. It all dates all the way back to, if you guys haven't heard of Homer Hickam and uh, in that picture on the slide, I am featured with him. He's in the green jacket. Um, and that was October Sky and the beginning of 
uh, model rocketry and many of the excitement. And that's a great story to read. We have two organizations. We have National Association of Rocketry and we have Tripoli Rocketry Association. TRA is right here in Wisconsin and that is who hosts our competition within the state. And so all of you will be getting your Tripoli um, certification if you have a successful flight and you are able to recover your rocket. Um, we have a couple of links in here and you can always go back and you can look at them due to time. We are going to skip over those for tonight. The one thing I wanna show you is we've got tons of um, rockets here on this display and these are from our uh, First Nations launch. But I wanna encourage you that rocketry is not just, you know, where everybody does everything the same. We have lots of creativity and we have lots of different designs. And so as you become more familiar with rocketry, you have the opportunity to make something uh, unique and different, whether as a team or as an individual. And with that being said, Trent, you're up. So it's actually Jane this time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I deferred, excuse well, me, go ahead, Jane. Yeah, Rocketry 101. So typically when you are building a rocket, you will have your rocket on the launch pad, your power ascent, that is when your motor is actively burning, you will notice usually you see your smoke trail. And then there is the coasting flight where it is still going up even though you are done burning your motor. At the highest point where it starts to arch over, that is your apogee, that is the highest point in flight. And then you have an ejection charge. Ejection charge is just a little bit of black powder that will separate, it'll blow up, but it will not blow up your rocket, hopefully. And it will separate your rocket into two pieces to which your parachute will get yanked out and will open up in the wind. And then your rocket should hopefully, and it should slowly descend to its landing site. That is a typical um, rocket that is not dual deployment, that is single deployment. And what I just described was in figure one dash, four dash one, sorry. Now, a lot of people tend to move on to dual deployment after you go with your certification for level one, um, level two flights, the competition flight. In 4-2, you will see a dual deployment rocket. You'll notice it looks very similar to your single deployment all the way to your first ejection charge. Still a little bit of black powder that goes off and it pulls your rocket apart into two. But you'll notice that with the drogue deploy, um, as seen in 4-2 in the little parentheses, it is a smaller parachute that gets pulled out. And this is slowing down your rocket, um, slowing down its descent, but it is not quite what you would want it to land on. It would have a very hard landing if it did that. But this helps pull your rocket to make it closer to the landing site I don't know how many of you guys have been to Richard Bong State Rec, but you don't really want to walk a mile in it. Um, so once it slows down with your drogue chute, there will be a second ejection charge, which will break your rocket apart in one more place to which your main parachute or your big parachute will come out. The big parachute will slow your rocket down the rest of the way so that when you land, you are landing closer to the launch site and it is landing softly and not shattering upon hitting the ground. Now, your competition flight. It is a little bit more difficult than what a typical standard rocketry flight would be. For the CRL competition, I led my team two years ago and we had this waiver, The App altitude window. And this year for your CRL competition, you guys will be launching a rocket that needs to be nothing lower than 2,500 feet and nothing higher than 3,500 feet. That is, hold on a second. Sorry, I just got a puppy and she found a bag of stuff. Um, so, 
your rocket will be going up for liftoff. It will be typical as your rockets are. Um, the difference is your pre-launch checklist. 100% take that to the launch pad. Um, that will help you keep track and make sure that you don't forget anything such as arming electronics, which would be very bad. You will still ascend and do the coast. Your apogee will still be its highest point, but in your competition, you desperately want it to be within that window of opportunity. You will be doing a dual deployment. So your drogue deployment, that's the tiny or smaller parachute. Some people use a streamer that will slow down your rocket and help you get to a closer recovery point. And then you have your main parachute, which will finish the descend and slow it down all the way to its landing point. All right, air structure, well, the structures. So in figure five dash one, you get to see each part of a rocket. So on the very top, you are seeing the exterior. Every rocket you have seen a picture of, this is the part you see. You don't see all of the stuff happening inside. So some really quick terms to know. Your nose cone is your pointed dome shape, and that is your forward part of your rocket. Think of it as the front. It goes up first, there's your forward. And that is usually, that is attached to your sustainer section, which is a nice middle chunk. It's also where part of your coupler will be. As you go further down the rocket, you get your booster section, which is where your main airframe and your fins are. At the very end of your rocket, it's called the aft part of your rocket. That is the bottom. Now, below the very pretty part of your rocket, your exterior, there is an image of the insides or the guts of your rocket. So starting at the aft or the back end of your rocket, you see a motor mount. The motor mount is what sits right inside of your airframe and is epoxied and has fins, your fins will be epoxied right through to the motor mount. Then from the motor mount, you see those centering rings that is attached to your main body tube and that's gonna keep you in place. It has a shock cord that will run from the bottom through your rocket to your recovery section. Your recovery area, that is where your parachute sits and is encased usually in Nomex or dog bar if something fireproof. Otherwise you will have holes in your parachute. Um, and that all sits inside the airframe. Your coupler is what will connect your airframe or your, and your booster section to your sustainer section. So typically your coupler will sit nice and tight and be attached to the sustainer and it'll be a nice fit to the booster. This means your parachute, when your rocket breaks apart uh, for your ejection charge, it's going to break right in between that booster and sustainer section. And that's where your parachute is going to be yanked out and come out of. At the bottom of figure five dash one, you have what I like to call is the X-ray vision version of a rocket. If you had some cool x-ray glasses, you can see the outside and the inside simultaneously, really sweet. And <clears throat> what you are looking at there, you can see the fins, how they go through the wall of your exterior all the way to your motor mount. So you can see that they do attach there. You are also able to see that your motor mount is inside of your aft area of your booster section. And you can see that the parachute will be running, or sorry, the shock cord runs through there to the parachute. And as I had described, the coupler section sits right in the middle of the booster and sustainer section so that it is holding onto both sides of the rocket. And then of course your nose cone is attached to the top. Ah, thank you, Kevin. Kevin is showing a very wonderful view of a thin, being held in place at the motor mount. So, and then, oh, yep, that's good. <laughs> Frank. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Frank Noble. I'll describe the uh, 
level one rocket that you will be uh, constructing uh, tonight and tomorrow. Uh, the rocket is called the uh, Lock Precision Caliber ISP. It's a three inch diameter rocket with a 30 millimeter uh, motor mount installed. It has the uh, heavy duty airframe tubing, which is uh, uh, craft cardboard with uh, glassine coated, rolled everything together. It has the uh, precision cut plywood fins and motor mount rings, pre-slotted airframe for easy insertion of your fins and alignment. Uh, has a plastic nose cone, a payload section, AKA sustainer, a nylon parachute recovery system, and a shock cord mount. And this does not come with the baffle system. We're gonna be using a, uh, a Nomex and uh, cellulose insulation to protect your chute on this rocket. Uh, the uh, length of the rocket is approximately 60 inches. Weight is uh, ooh, a little over, uh, what, just under two pounds. 29 ounces. Uh, the suggested motors they have on the lower right hand corner for the type of motor you'd like to use, but you're going to be using a uh, H motor for your certification. And we have several types. The ones they show there are for um, uh, reloadable motor system. I suggest the uh, disposal motor systems, which is very uh, uh, handy and uh, you don't have to buy the hardware. Next, please. We're gonna be doing the uh, rock sim introduction. Uh, simulations are the key components to high power rocket design. It's the first oh, thing you'll okay. have to design your competition rocket. Yes, ma'am. I think this is Trent's slide. Go ahead. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. Uh, uh, so in addition to uh, being able to know the components of the rocket, how they fit together, how to build it, um, it can be extremely useful to know how to evaluate that rocket using a computer application. And so the, the one of choice that we're going to be talking about uh, today and tomorrow is RockSim. It's not the only one, but it's a very polished um, uh, application. And I think that everyone here will get some very good use out of it. Um, the purpose of using RockSim or other programs like it is threefold. Um, the first one is to be able to model your rocket um, similar to how you would model anything in a, a CAD program like Fusion 360 or SolidWorks, whatever your um, particular flavor of choice happens to be. Um, and that modeling can be done from scratch, um, which I prefer in many cases. Um, or alternatively, there are uh, databases online in which um, people have graciously um, built uh, existing kits, like for example, uh, the lock kit that you have, that we have, um, that you can then download and then use as a base to start tinkering with. Um, so from scratch or from an existing model. Um, second is to determine the characteristics of that rocket, um, which you will be flying. And um, with determining those characteristics, uh, really what we're looking for here is to make sure that you were flying a safe rocket, something that is not going to uh, flip over sideways, hurt somebody, explode, fall too fast, et cetera. So you're looking for things like the center of pressure, center of gravity, margin of stability, and, and we'll go into each one of those um, uh, uh, properties uh, later into, um, into our time here together. Um, and then finally, to simulate the flight, actually, um, because this is not a, a, a physics problem. Uh, well, it's a physics problem, but it's not a physics problem that involves neglecting air friction and then everything runs in a vacuum. Um, it is, it's really helpful to be able to uh, set up a simulation where you can, you know, mess with uh, wind directions and, and the variability of wind and um, what happens to be the pressure that day. And, and those are all things that we can go ahead and, and tinker with in RockSim and then um, even make on the fly changes potentially to the rocket based on the day of wind conditions and uh, other weather conditions. Um, this is a screen capture from RockSim. Um, it's, it's one of three main-ish windows. Um, and th this is a wireframe model, uh, very similar, not, not exactly, but very similar to um, what the lock kit that we will all be building today uh, will look like. Um, and I think right now, uh, what I'd like to do then, Danielle, is uh, share my screen and I am going to open up RockSim very quickly and then show how you can uh, download a copy of the, the lock ISP kit. Um, from an online database and, 
and uh, take that as like a, a, a base point. So can I go ahead and share my screen right now? And Trent, you are anticipating the student, everybody part, uh, attending is doing the same thing right along with you, correct? Um, they certainly can. And uh, with that in mind, I can go a little bit slower. Um, otherwise I was gonna click through pretty quick, but um, yeah. So if you have Roxim installed on your computer, by all means, follow along with me. And um, if there's any issues or questions, please uh, just yell at me. Okay, so I'll start by opening up Roxim, which I already have installed. And everybody should have it installed already. So hopefully you do. If not, you'll be able to catch up. Okay. So this is the main interface. Um, not too much to see at the moment. Uh, I, I kind of like to think about Roxim as, um, as a, a CAD program, if a CAD program were a point and click adventure. You know, it's, it's a little bit more rudimentary than um, other programs you might be used to. But um, once you get past a couple of the quirks, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm not going to do anything in here yet um, because I, I found that when finding my way around the application, it is easiest to start from something as opposed to nothing and then work your way back to starting from scratch. Um, so instead of starting to play around with the, um, with the tools and stuff inside of Roxim, what instead I'm going to do is I'm going to go out to, um, what is the name of that website? Ah, rocketreviews.com. Okay. So it actually cut me a little bit earlier there. And I have made that link available in the chat so you can click on it yourselves. Okay. So in rocketreviews.com, um, there will be a page called Roxim Library. And um, it, it, this is certainly not an extensive list of every kit that has ever been made by every manufacturer, but there's a drop down at the top here. And uh, from here, you can go ahead and then you can filter by, uh, by a bunch of different vendors. I didn't realize that there were this many different companies out there building kits. Um, but um, our kit is Lock Precision. And then, so if I just search for ISP, um, I can see down here that uh, the caliber ISP is something that's in the database. And uh, also note the date on this too, it, unless I'm reading that incorrectly, it looks like this was uploaded a very long time ago. Um, so we'll have to keep an eye on, you know, what the quality of this model is when we open it up. But I'll click here. And assuming that this is, yep, this is where I need to be. Um, I will go ahead and I will download it. And I'm just gonna drop it down onto my desktop for right now. So you could probably just double click that and it would open in Roxim, but what I'll do instead is I'll go back to Roxim here and I'll go file and open. And then from my desktop, which is where I dropped it, then I'll just go ahead and I'll click on the lock caliber ISP. Don't worry about this one over here. That was just me messing around and, and trying to build the same thing from scratch. And there it is. Um, now that we have this bottom screen populated, um, it becomes much, much more apparent what's going on here. So um, in this lower screen here, you can mess around and you can look at this thing from a wireframe two-dimensional view. You can look at it from straight on. And I'm using this little drop down in the corner here to do this. And you can actually visualize it in 3D as well. It looks ugly at the moment here because there's a whole bunch of you know graphical things and color things that you can do to your rocket. Um, to make it look a little bit more pleasing. Um, but mostly you're gonna be here. This, this is really where you wanna be in terms of looking at the rocket. Um, so here's your wireframe. And then up top here, uh, underneath rocket design components, you can see uh, what I would refer to uh, from the engineering world this is the feature tree. And you can see that uh, there's a parent-child relationship between a bunch of the different components here. So for example, the uh, uh, the main airframe tube, which is uh, 
uh, in their vernacular anyways, is this larger section of the rocket here. Um, we would call it the booster section. You can see that um, uh, uh, subcomponents of that include things like the parachute, the motor mount, um, and things that would actually exist inside that part of the component. And uh, similarly for the sustainer, or in this particular case, I think they call it the, the, uh, the payload section slash airframe tube. Um, so that is the, that's the 10,000 foot level of Roxim and uh, how to uh, get started by downloading an existing model to start tinkering around with. Uh, Trent, you have a few more minutes. Do you want to go into any of the, um, the tabs up on top so that that might take a little bit of time, you know, cover us a little bit later on? Sure. Just navigate through the whole the whole um, program so folks are familiar maybe with each section until you've got about seven minutes. Awesome. Um, so uh, on the first tab here underneath rocket design attributes, um, you'll find that there are just like playing around with Microsoft Word or any other application really, there are a ton of things that you can do which are not absolutely critical to you operating the program. Um, but will be convenient or nice for you maybe in the future. So, you know, um, underneath rocket design attributes, uh, a lot of this is um, just giving giving your rocket a definition um, so that if somebody else were to open it, they would specifically, they, they'd be able to know, they'd say, okay, well, you know, this is the name and um, it has this many stages. Um, it gives you a reference for the static margin. Um, some of these things will auto-populate, some things you can fill in yourself, um, but for now, realistically, the only thing you really probably have to worry about here is just giving your rocket a distinct name so that you can, you know, remember what it is that you're working on. Um, the second tab here, the rocket design components, um, you will be here 90% of the time, um, whether you're operating from an existing model or starting fresh from your own. And um, later on, perhaps we'll start from a fresh uh, rocket and then kind of build our way out. Um, but for the case of starting with a rocket that already exists, it's important to know how to modify each one of these components. And so, um, for example, uh, the easiest way to do that is just by selecting one of the components, like the nose cone, for example, and double clicking it. And then from there, another window opens up. And this is real slick because it, it's intuitive. All you need to do is double click it. You can rename the nose cone to something, you know, more clever or something more specific to you. And then there are just a ton of different ways that you can modify this nose cone. Um, you can try to make it look as close to um, what the dimensions are in real life. Or if you are trying to do something a little bit more experimental, it has parameters to allow you to do things that are a little bit strange and weird perhaps for a nose cone, but we're not gonna be doing that today. Um, for example, here, um, you know, a, a, a very simple thing to do is I can change the, uh, the standard shape from uh, what it currently is set at to um, parabolic. So it gives the nose cone a much more rounded shape. And uh, I can change the length. I can make it a lot taller or so short that it barely exists. And I can click OK there. And that looks ugly now, but that's OK because I didn't save it. And I'll probably um, open it up again fresh when we're actually working with it again. Um, Similarly with the fins, uh, the, and we're going to talk about the fins later too. So this is just me opening it up to show you. The fins probably give people the most trouble just because uh, there are a lot of parameters in order to uh, make the fins look the way you want. If, if you're trying to make the fins look like something that already exists in real life, it's a little bit more challenging than if you're just being creative on your own part. Because if, if, if the fins are just in your imagination, and uh, you can do whatever looks aesthetically pleasing and then figure out later whether or not it functionally works with your rocket. But if you're trying to model something that already exists, um, well, on page 19, you'll get a lot of useful uh, information on that. Um, but yeah, so like um, uh, I can change the location by shoving this up and down like so. And you'll notice that there are dots on the screen as well that move when I do this. And we'll talk about what those are a little bit later too. Um, similarly, I can make some really crazy looking fins like that. That looks kind of cool, actually. I like that a lot, but that's not functional at all. Um, how am I doing on time, Christine? 
You have three minutes, sir. I still have three minutes. Okay, cool. Um, Uh, so for, uh, for, for Roxim as well, um, mass is something that's extremely helpful. Um, it is important if you're working from a kit that you go ahead and you weigh all of your components so that you know uh, for sure uh, how much your rocket weighs. And, and not just specifically weighing the rocket as a entire unit, but really getting in there and then weighing individual components. I'm a huge proponent of um, because that will help you verify things like, for example, your center of gravity. Um, uh, but sometimes if, if you're working with maybe not all of your components in the room with you, or if you are instead uh, working from a scratch build, um, you don't have that option. And, and, and this is really where um, using uh, applications like RockSim shine as well, because um, not only can you define the geometries of how your rock is going to look, but you can also um, use uh, uh, preset materials to estimate how much your rocket is going to weigh and where that weight is going to lie inside of the airframe. So for example, here again on the fin properties uh, uh, page, I can go ahead to this material drop down and I can choose between a whole bunch of uh, different materials. And um, there's a lot uh, more than I would ever really functionally need to use. I mean, realistically for every rocket that I've built, it's either been uh, G10 fiberglass, one flavor of that, um, or it's uh, uh, some type of aircraft, aircraft plywood. And so you can see here um, G10 and a bunch of different formulations. Uh, it even goes down so far as to differentiate between G10 by vendor. So like uh, uh, here it says um, uh, specifically G10 fiberglass for lock precision uh, kits. Um, and in addition to all this, um, if you are still having difficulty uh, determining the mass or maybe the material properties that Roxin provides you aren't specific enough or, or maybe you're a little bit off compared to what you're measuring in real life, um, this tab over here in the corner is the mass override tab. And, and what that will allow you to do is um, just go ahead and then put in the mass that uh, you want for that particular component. And um, this becomes very useful for, thing, for things, not so much the, um, the fins, but uh, maybe you have electronics in your rocket, or um, maybe you have some other obscure component. Maybe, well, I really hope you're not putting a GoPro on your, cam on your rocket because there are lighter cameras out there. Um, but like if you did have a GoPro on your rocket, um, you know, a GoPro is not a standard item inside of rocks and clearly so, um, using the mass override tab for that particular component would be very useful. Excellent, thank you. Do you have anything else, Trent, or are we good to go? No, nope. no, I'm done blabbering. All right, excellent, thank you so much. Hopefully that gives you guys a good understanding of the beginning of Roxim, and we will continue to build on that. Um, so if you, do, you, know, you, you got your, your rocket in and the kit's in, you wanna keep that there because we are going to be building on that kit throughout the entire workshop. So you'll be adding pieces as we go along. So um, I'm hoping, um, Kevin, do you have epoxy with you in the two, two um, uh, containers? Perfection. So um, all of you should have received epoxy. And just do a quick overview. You, have, you should have received two separate bottles. One is a resin and one is a hardener. So when we ask you to mix them, it is extremely important that it is a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and you know that's what you have your paper plates for. Uh, to be able to put that on your paper plate, you're gonna use a craft stick uh, and, it, and he's showing you like, just go in those little circles, you know, about a quarter size, right? And um, you're gonna use probably a craft stick, mix that up, make sure it's mixed really, really well. And I believe we went with a five minute epoxy. So you have to work um, rather quickly so that it doesn't dry too fast. Um, and so you don't wanna over um, put too much on your plate at once. Otherwise it's gonna dry and you're not gonna be able to use it. So use it sparingly, but use it well and with purpose. Um, there are different types of epoxy. So there's ones that are time related, some that are strength, 
Um, you've got different brands. You've got JB Weld. You've got the one that we sent you. I can't remember which one it is. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you can add a silica as well. And so different types, we tend to use the two, um, but there's also even like, at times when we've run out for workshops, we've gotten the kind where you press one button and the two come out at once. So different uh, versions, but epoxy. Now, when we create fillet, so that's what we're gonna call um, the line of epoxy that you're gonna put in certain areas. So we're gonna start with the um, centering rings tonight. And so you are gonna put the, uh, the epoxy around the inside center of the, um, the, the the centering rings. You'll also be putting epoxy on your fins. And so when you have a fin, you wanna have a fillet. So it's a nice concave um, uh, uh, length of epoxy. And we'll go over it a little bit more, but I just wanted you to be aware you're gonna uh, put that on. You're, you're trying to create this bond between two surfaces. And when you apply it and apply it with a craft stick, you wanna make sure it's kind of like when you do, um, uh, what is it called? in your bathtub, I'm always thinking of it, um, caulk, you know, you take and you do one long straight line and you don't stop and you don't like take your finger and go, oh, I wanna dab it. You wanna do one straight line because that's gonna give you the best um, adhesion and the best effect that you're looking for. And so you wanna create those valleys that are um, between the two surfaces. If you, you know, have extra time tonight, you wanna look it up, uh, there is a website uh, or a PDF referred to on here that you can go and look at. Um, Frank, I think I just got us behind schedule. My apologies. Go for your prefit check. Okay, everybody who has their uh, rocket laid out in separate pieces. Uh, Kevin, what are we going to start with? The uh, Go ahead and show the object you want to do first for a prefit. Let's do our, our, um, our motor mode centering rings and your motor tube. You're gonna make sure the bolts fit together snug, not loose, but snug. So that means you have to uh, stand the uh, inside of the uh, centering ring and the motor tube itself. There's a glassine coating on the motor tube. It's kind of shiny. It's a waxy um, film on there. You have to kind of generously remove that, not to the part where the, where the tube gets fuzzy, but just enough to remove that glassine so the epoxy can adhere to the two components, the centering ring and the motor mount tube. Hey, don't forget to put on those uh, those gloves too if you uh, would like to. Actually, they probably grip better than your skin right now because your skin might be a little dry during this weather, especially when you're trying to grab the back of the sandpaper. After you've sanded and fit the center rings onto the motor mount tube, unless we need another uh, we need another thirty seconds for everyone. The idea of doing hey Frank, the middle. Hey Frank, the aft and the forward ones, how close are they to the end? Are they flush with the end or do we leave a little tail or what? Uh, you generally leave uh, about a quarter inch on each end. Okay, thanks. And make it a snug fit is fine. And after, install, uh, after fitting the uh, centering rings onto the uh, tube, of course, you should have three of them, I hope. Install the eye bolt into the forward centering ring. Uh, a good reminder is to mark the, uh, the centering rings, the aft, the mid, and the forward, I believe that says. My, my little icon is in the way here. Forward, yes.
Frank, were we having everybody um, label each one of those rings? I just mentioned that. Okay, I'm sorry. I said mark, not label, I guess. <laughs> a good idea. The aft with the two holes in it, I hope everybody has two holes in their aft centering ring. If uh, not, let me know. It sounds like everybody has them. Identify the aft, uh, grab the aft. Once you have your uh, centering rings fit, grab your aft centering ring. And you should have some really small, tiny T-nuts. Line up the T-nuts into the holes of the aft ring and tap, tap or pound the the T-nuts into the holes. You can probably push them in with your finger and then turn it around onto a hard surface and push down. I worked on mine today. All you have to do is put the screw in to secure it. The teeth of the uh, T-nut will go right into the plywood very easily. Kevin, can you show the T-nuts the one more time? It's kind of dark. Let me pull one out for you. And then there's a question of the orientation, which 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 is toward the fore of the rocket, which is toward the aft. Okay, as you, I would I would I would mark the. The spot you put the T nut in. That would be the forward. So when you put that centering ring on, you won't see it. All you see is the hole, with the threads. So this is the inside of the rocket. Right. After ring. Now it'd be the back. Frank, you got muted from the feedback. You have to unmute yourself. <clears throat> Sorry, that's the aft end, which is the motor retention system. That's where the motor goes in, and those are the clips that hold the motor in. Uh, the motor uh, has to be uh, retained in, so when it uh, ejects, it doesn't go flying out the back end. That's the reason for the motor retention. There you go, Kevin. Of course, it probably won't fit on a reload. It fits. There you go. So as we are, uh, oh. as you as you guys finish up the aft ring, maybe give us a you know a thumbs up, letting us know that you uh, have yeah. completed that, so we know to go on to the next one. Next Excellent. Step. I don't know if they had that capability of doing that. Also, if that system isn't uh, working uh, to your benefit, I did include a another clip with a self-tapping screw. It's not in with the rocket kit, it's in with your supplies, if you've noticed. You can shape that clip, clip if you want to, to conform to the motor. Uh, does the orientation of the holes matter at all? No. Hey, Glenn, all I can do is uh, I got to click the, uh, you have a feature on your little thumbnail in the upper right-hand corner. You should be able to click that and his screen should be full on yours. There you go. Good job. Thank you, Kevin.
Hey, so uh, on the aft ring, you have, uh, you got those uh, screws sticking out like so, right? Yes. Okay. And that goes on. That's going to be, that's going to be facing the aft end of the rocket. And they're going to be kind of a handle for you. That's going to let, that's going to be one of the last parts you're going to put on when you've constructed the motor mount tube, because that's going to stay off for a long time. And that and those little, um, uh, clips you have on there is a good handle so you can manipulate that ring to install it and take it out if you, if you have to during our construction. But that's going to be glued in permanently after we're all done. And the, the eyelet uh, is on uh, the outside, right? Yep. And roughly about a quarter inch from the end? Yes. And in a couple more slides, we'll be going over the, the spacing. Um, so right now, focusing more so on making sure you have the, they're sanded, you have your eye bolt, you have your T-nuts in. Um, that's what we wanna make sure everybody has completed before we go on to the next step. Uh, the, the quarter inch, that is required or required on the forward aft with the uh, eye bolt is uh, recommended. On the back end, on the aft end, where the uh, last centering ring goes on, it's going to vary from where you position your your uh, tube to your fin slots. It'll vary from a quarter inch to maybe an eighth inch. So just as long as that motor mount ring goes on that motor tube and secured with uh, epoxy later on. As I'm watching, just so you know, you do not, when you're trying to put your eye bolt in, um, your, your ring does not have to be on the motor mount. You can do that while it's off the motor mount to make it much easier uh, to handle. And of course, on the forward motor mount ring, don't forget to put your washer on top and a washer on back with your nut. Because that is a pulling part of the rocket where your recovery cord pulls on during apogee. Thanks, Kevin. That's good. Next. Okay, let's uh, work with the bulk plate. Install an eye bolt into the bulk plate. It should be easily installed. You don't have to pre-drill or anything. If it's kind of tight, just screw it in by hand. I don't know if people have two washers or one washer. What did you get with that, Kevin? Two. Two, okay. One nut on the eye bolt side of the centering ring. A uh, small washer and nut on the back side end of the ball plate. Uh, tighten it up snug. If you have a uh, players with you, uh, use them if you have to. Or you can do is just uh, generously hold the, uh, the nut with your hand and twist the eye bolt to tighten it up. Uh, later on, when we get the glue out, we're gonna be putting a dab of epoxy on those threads just so uh, it locks in and doesn't come on, come on screw. Next, uh, after you have the eye bolt on, I want you to uh, dry fit the bulk plate into the coupler tube. Make sure you're grabbing the coupler tube, not the airframe tube. Coupler tube, please. And do a, a fit. What is the difference? Make sure that they, let's show both the coupler um, and the airframe so they know the difference. Yeah, he's got the coupler showing it. 
For reference, your airframe is white. That's right. Coupler's brown. Thanks, Kevin. Sand the outside of the bog plate to make a proper fit. Don't make it too loose. Just make it snug. Place a coupler uh, bog plate about a quarter inch from the end of the coupler. Everything that's usually inside installed inside or install, installed inside or external of the tube, it's pretty much a quarter inch. Because that quarter inch will allow you to put a nice fillet of epoxy on there. Next page, please. Hope everybody's caught up. If not, uh, give me some kind of sign. I can see some people are still working on the previous page steps. Okay. Yes. So let's. Well, we're probably a little ahead right now, probably. Yeah, I think we can, we can hold up and give folks a chance to catch up. Yep. Is it literally just push them in and that's it? Yep. Uh, we are going to put we're going to put some uh, epoxy on the end of it just to keep them locked in. But not yet. Not doing epoxy yet. No, I said we are going to later on. Because I know my, uh, mines are running like, well, this bolt ain't tight enough. Uh, these T nuts aren't going to stay in here, so just a heads up, we will be epoxying them later. Jimmy, are you good? I see a flashlight. Um, everything okay? Uh, I lost one of my uh, my teeth washers or nuts. Oh, <laughs> you, you weren't the only one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who are you talking about? Uh, so I, I think it's a good point. I, and I'm hoping you find them. You know, you're in the same workspace. But, you know, when we talked about those little pieces, you know, throw them into one of those Dixie cups so that you have them or if you have a little baggie, because um, uh, it's really easy to misplace or lose them or have them get caught underneath a piece of paper or something. Well, another thing we could do is uh, if you have a cloth, you can put on your tabletop, anything that hits a cloth, like a towel, won't bounce. So that's why you always see people who work on watches and jewelry spread cloth over their tabletops. We only have plastic here, but... Uh, Great idea, thanks. And for anyone who has lost theirs, um, I can tell you from experience, they're number 10 screw nuts, 10, and they're coarse, so they're 10-24. Found it. And if you do lose them totally and you can't operate correctly, I did include these little, these little, these little clips on here with a, a self-tapping screw for a motor retention system, just for a backup. Hey, can I see the, uh, hold on, let's see. Well, no, okay, sorry, we're getting feedback because I was on the other computer. Uh, can I see the half section again? And do you think, could we do it without um, sharing the slides for a sec so I could get a, a bigger view of what Kevin's showing? How's that? Is that the slide you needed? Yeah, uh, I just, just want to see Kevin's screen and no PowerPoint at all. Yeah, awesome. just, just like get a little bit bigger view of it to make gotcha. sure. Gotcha. There's also an option um, to swap your share screen, the shared screen with the video, so you can make Kevin's screen up close. Yeah, I was looking for that. Do you know where it is? <laughs> I got it. Up there. Oh, okay, we got it now. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay, and so that, that so that one side, those um. It's kind of like those, what, what's it called? The washers with the little pegs and you kind of hammer those in, you said? Peanuts. Peanuts, yep. Okay. So this is the inside of the rocket. That's the inside side? Okay. Like pointing pointing up, basically? Yeah. Okay. And can I see the back side real quick again? 
Okay, so you got you got a washer or two on there? I can't quite tell. Uh, I don't have a washer in there, but uh, one would probably be okay. Okay, thanks. And then, then there, are... washer's not really required there. You don't have to put one there. The washer will block the threads from going down, so I would. Yep. I would... Uh, but on the screw side, the bolt side, you could have a washer there, so it gets more bite on the plate. Um, the plates there can have two orientations, right? Um, there's kind of a curved side, and that's the, the side that I have mounted flush with the, the centering ring is the curved side of the, uh, the piece. How about I do this? How about I take off one of the attachment points? Yeah. And then. Yeah. And most likely you're not going to need a washer because um, the clip probably won't bottom out anyways on the uh, on the ring once you put a motor in there. The only reason I put a washer in is the screw heads are very small and it looked like it might actually pass through the bracket at one point. It does fit just fine without the washer. That goes, uh, it says on the tree probably. Yeah. It's a good fit, Kevin. Is that face the aft? That face is the aft, correct? This is the aft part of the aft ring. Uh, does the retainers? Face the aft. You're looking at the outside aft portion of the rocket. Yes, the, the clips are on the aft part. You go in just like that once we get it completed. Just like that. If you're looking for a whole structure view, I, I refer to page 17, 5-5. Five five. You can see one on the right on that picture. That's how they're going to look. Rocket won't be that big, but that's the same, same uh, type of setup. Figure 5-5 five five on the right-hand side. All we're doing is a fit on the rings on the motor tube and installing the retention screws. Are we good there, uh, Green Bay? Yeah, you're talking to Green Bay or Sheboygan? Green Bay. I don't think so. So I think okay. we're good. There's our aft. Perfect. You got it. Yep. 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 We were, we were just playing around the fins. James, how you doing there? That's pretty tiny, isn't it? Yeah. I got uh, sausage fingers, so. Okay. Don't help. <laughs> Just for a time check, um, we have 15 minutes left to the pre-fit check. I need to see more people here. Dylan, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm on a, I'm not, you can see me on the other screen. I'm on Dorenzo's computer's right behind me, but I'm doing good right now. Andrew, how are you doing? Uh, doing good. Should Excellent. Good. good job. And Addison, you, you're a pro. Hey, Trent. 
Hey, Elizabeth, we can't, I can't see your work area. I can see you. Um, are you good to go? Are you on track? How about you, Drake? Um, I think so. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, great. Ian, you, you okay? I can't tell which, which end should the screws go through here for the ad part. Should they go through oh, the- Oh, again, Kevin, you got, you got the big picture there? Can you see the big picture there, Ian? So it looks like the head of the screw went through that side. And yep. Oh, yeah, that's through there. oh, okay, I got you. Max, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. I got this, these done. I'm gonna reverse this and then I've got this done too. So. Okay, great, great. Hey, you guys are pretty good. But Glenn, Glenn, my man, with all the questions. Oh, Glenn, rocket, that's right. Do you have your rocket, Glenn? You're good, okay. I got it, thank you. All right, I think um, we probably can move on to the next step. Slide 22, yeah. Okay, you got the centering rings should fit on the motor tube. What you'll have to do is mark the forward end of the motor mount tube, one eighth of an inch to three sixteenths uh, from the forward centering ring placement. I'm just gonna reference a mark on the forward motor mount with the ring to reference a, the one eighth or three sixteenths mark how far back the centering ring should be from that on that motor tube. So just draw a line and where's your uh, picture there? And you guys have a ruler in your in your kit. So if you're unsure what an eighth or a three sixteenth inch is, feel free to pull that out and utilize it. Um, as, as you can see how uh, Kevin is marking that location. So if you are one eighth or a quarter inch or three sixteenths away from the end there, you know where to place your glue once you uh, place your glue above that line. Yep. Frank, are you having them um, mark on each side of the ring so that the ring goes in the middle of two lines? I know we did that. I believe we did that before. Uh, it's up to the uh, up to the user. If you want to mark both ends, uh, be my guest. Go ahead. Okay. Now, once you get that, everybody have theirs measured pretty good and in place? Yep. Now, you have to grab your, uh, look at the aft end of your uh, motor mount tube. That's the opposite side of the spot you're working. Measure the distance from the aft end of the airframe. Oh, I'm sorry, you got to grab the airframe. Excuse me. Grab your airframe. and measure the distance from the aft end of the airframe to the forward fin slot. Uh, Kevin will show you that. As you measure it from the aft end of the airframe to the top of the fin slot on the airframe, the white piece airframe, This will be the measurement for your center motor mount ring. So we should have a five and a quarter. Does everybody agree? Yes. We 
we do that just to reference, make sure that those uh, fin slots are at that distance. Uh, some of the manufacturers might be off a little bit, so I just want to make sure you have that measurement. Now, on your motor mount tube, measure from draw a line in the same uh, distance on the motor mount tube for the center mount ring placement. Note the measurement measurement of the aft end of the motor mount tube should be five and a quarter. Frank, did that change with the difference in the size of of the fins or anything? Because I know they no. were different. No. Okay. No. Perfect. No. We checked that already. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We found ours are about a sixteenth of an inch longer. So we're going to one. Bit. 16th is not so bad. It doesn't have to be a fit snug, but just as long as that, that uh, center motor mount ring clears the top fin slots when you uh, install the motor mount. We're going to do a pre-check on that in a minute. Mine is about a 16th off as well. Yeah. So if you can't see the picture or um, Kevin's video too well, go ahead and reference the handbook figure 13-5 on the bottom, you can see the alignment that we're talking about with the center motor ring being forward of the fin slot. Because if it's within that fin slot, you're not gonna be able to put your fins in. That's right. If there's a 16th of a gap in there, that's no problem. That can be filled in with uh, epoxy once you install it. So take your ruler and mark from the aft end of your motor mount tube, five and a quarter inches. Mark it probably in two spots and then slide your centering ring, your motor mount centering ring, your mid ring onto the motor mount tube and draw a circle around it. The suggestion we probably should have done that uh, before we put the rings on. Always keep, keep that aft motor mount ring off. We've already prepped it. We, we uh, fit sanded it. Keep it off for now. We're working uh, on the middle. Yeah. So when you say five and a quarter, it's five and a quarter from the end of the motor mount tube? Yeah. Yep. Just as the uh, picture shows on 13-5 uh, in your book there. And like Danielle said, the main point of this is to make sure that your mid set that centering uh, center or mid centering ring um, does not enter into that sl fin slot. So making sure we, we gave you the five and a quarter, but as people are measuring, they're finding it a little bit different. So make sure you are measuring your fin slot so that you know exactly where to place that. And again, I always encourage you because we've had uh, uh, students, you know, if, if they don't put that double line around the ring, they forget which side they're supposed to uh, put the epoxy on, you know, so just really helps you in the end. As you can see on the, on, uh, on page four on 13.5, it shows the motor sticking out a little bit from the airframe. And if you want to line up your motor tube and your centering ring to adjust your, your aft motor tube to uh, be inside the airframe or just stick it outside the airframe, that's fine with me. Just as long as that center motor mount ring clears the top fin slot. And use the standard five and a quarter inches. Now, if you have to pre-fit, pre-fit the motor mount into the airframe, you may have to put a, uh, a little thin layer of 
Where's my camera here? Oh, you want me to switch your spotlight? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Let me... Uh, I have a, a layer of tape right here in the center motor mount ring and the forward one just to make it stiff so it stays on there so I can I can put it in the airframe to test fit it and make sure that the rings will go inside the airframe because you may have to sand the outside of the motor mount rings too. So make sure they fit inside the airframe. Um, just as a time check, Frank, um, it's five or seven thirty-three. This section is supposed to be done at seven thirty-five, so we might want to talk about the next step for prepping folks because some people might be done um, hey. and they can go ahead with the uh, sanding. Sure, go ahead and uh, yep, sand your outside of your motor mount rings, centering rings, to fit inside the airframe. Just make, make it snug, not super loose. And while, while you got the sandpaper out, pre-fit your fins in your fin slots in the airframe also. Sometimes mm -hmm. the slots are pretty tight. If they're snug, that's good. But if it's tight and you can't get it in and you think you're going to bend the airframe by installing the fins into the uh, slots. Uh, take your craft stick and wrap some sandpaper around it and sand your your fin slats, kind of like a fingernail file. I found mine to be kind of tight this morning when I was uh, running through everything. Right. Uh, to uh, Try and sand. Did everybody pre-fit their rings yet? Does, does it go in? It might go in a little tough, but you can push it in. That's what the, the tape is for, to hold the ring on the tube temporarily. So everybody, so everybody, uh, you can stop your sanding if you... I would stop your sanding on your rings because we can do that tomorrow once we mount mount the uh, motor mount ring inside the tube. We're doing that tomorrow, right, Christine? Uh, sorry, what was the question? I was getting ready to answer a chat. Uh, yeah. Jane, you want to answer that chat for me, please? Go ahead. What was it? Scott, are we gluing the motor mount tube in today or just the rings on the motor mount tube? Um, we are whatever is on slide 25. So you are um, fifth mid-centering ring at the measurement marked. You're sliding the ring down below. You're putting it on the motor mount. You're not putting it in tonight. Okay, good, great. Okay, we can, we can, we don't have to sand the outside of the ring tonight yet. We can do that tomorrow once we fit the whole motor tube inside the airframe. So what I want you to do, uh, the places where you have it marked with your pencil to uh, um, apply the uh, glue, mark it, and then pull off your, I would pull off your aft, you can keep your aft ring off. You know, it's just, it'll just be in the way. Just put that to the side. The one that has the motor mount retention system on it. You can pull that off once you mark it. Um, Frank, have we done the prefit check of the, are we completed with the airframe and the fins and the nose cone slide 23? I don't know. I told everybody to uh, prefit their fins on their, on their, uh, Okay. I saw and, everybody the ring, so. So the other thing to, um, on slide 23, and this is something that you'll be able to do after we complete um, the workshop tonight and before we start tomorrow, the nose cone. Um, maybe, um, Kevin, would you just mind it, uh, quickly showing everybody what they're going to do? Um, and I think they can do that in between tonight and tomorrow versus doing it live. Is there anything that they need to know about that? The seam, the plastic molding of the nose cone, it should stand out pretty good in the light. 
You see that straight line in the darkness here? All you gotta we do, do is sand it down with a finer grit sandpaper. And like I said, I think you guys can go ahead and um, complete that between tonight and tomorrow morning. Um, is there anybody, uh, just shout out if you have not completed the FinFit. Hey, just real quick question on the FinFit. So should there be a gap uh, there or no? Between the rings. Uh, there's a slight, should be a very slight, maybe a very slight gap, not a big gap. So you're if you have, if, like if you, have, you can push, you can push the aft ring up if you'd like. But that's five. So if because, I do that, uh, I get about uh, an eighth of an inch clearance on there. Yeah. Craig, can you show your picture a little bit closer so we can see it so they, they know exactly what you're referring to? Uh, you'll, you'll need to. I got about an eighth of an inch uh, on uh, this side right here. Do, do, you, do you have that center mounting, that centering motor mount ring, five and a quarter inches from the end of the aft? Yeah. Pre-check, remeasure, measure and remeasure. You'll drag. You'll need to. Uh, you'll be epoxying the part, parts of those fins, the centering ring. So um, just make it so you can do that later on. Yeah, Let me see that, Drake. Right? I didn't see that, Drake. What you had there? Which, what's that? So uh, when I I I got the centering at five and a quarter from the end here. Yep. When I put this on here, uh, I get about eighth of an inch uh, gap uh, right over here. Wow. On the aft side. Yeah. Right. And I got, you know, over a quarter inch on uh, space here. Is that yes, you see that. Hmm. So what, uh, I got a ruler. As long as your center ring is just at the top of the, the fin slot, that's your main alignment point. As long as that's in the right place, then your, you know, your um, aft centering ring, well, you can kind of move that around because it's not epoxied yet. So you're just going to push that right up against the bottom of the fin. Yeah, except that the brackets on the end here, are those, should those be on the inside or should they be facing outside? You got them, you got them right. You got them right. You can't push them any more forward, is what you're saying, because the retainer right. is yep. in hitting up against the tube. Yep. So your fin tab. Let's measure your fin tab. Of course, we didn't show the parts of the rock, the, the, the fin. That's that part that sticks down that touches the motor mount tube. That should be about uh, four and five eighths, just yeah, shorter. Four and five eighths, right on the head. Yeah. Well, that should. That should fit. That's because that's what I got. Hmm. So, so some of the math isn't adding up. I got four and three quarters on uh, between my uh, two. So. Yeah, I'm actually running into the same problem as Drag. Yeah, me as well. Kevin, are you having any of those issues? The same that we've had three now that their their fin is smaller than the fin slot. I'm not, and I'm just putting mine together to see where everything ends up. Okay. Are they actually smaller than the fin slot, guys? See? Just a little bit. A tiny little bit. They fit the fin slot. The problem is, is this. Can you see the gap? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, aft, the centering ring is set by the bracket, the retainer bracket. But when I put this on, it looks like the measurement you gave us is about one centering ring too far forward. So I think this, the, the mid ring needs to be one ring thickness back. 
So those those clips the, for the motor retaining clips, they don't have to be flush onto the mount. So you don't tighten those down until there's a motor case in place. I know oh. but if, I, if I slide this forward to, to match this, they won't ever cover that. They don't have to be flush to the back of that tube. They've got like a half inch worth of threads that they can back out. Oh, I see. So you're going to lower that screw down. Okay, fair enough. All there right, you go. Fair enough. There there you go. Go. My camera, this is a motor casing in here. And we need to have a little bit of extra room so these clips come over the motor casing to hold it in place. Okay, so then the, the after the yeah. after is going to take up the slack, huh? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you're you're working for something you don't see yet because you don't have it in your hands. Yep. Got it. Can you see this? Okay. So I tighten this screw up. It'll clip up oh, this motor case. They don't, have, they don't have a motor in there. <laughs> I know. So trying to show them something they don't have. So right, right. Stick. That's why we want the center motoring, the center motor mount ring clear the top of the fin slots. Because once you glue that in, that aft centering ring is going to stop up against that fin tab anyways, regardless if it's an eighth inch, quarter inch, or three sixteenths. It doesn't really matter. Danielle, there is no way to um, to zoom in on the picture, is there, on 22, that lower right-hand picture? I don't know if you can. Uh, no, but they have it in the handbook right in front of them, too. Okay, so, so really make sure you're looking at that. Um, if you have any questions... because that really does show you where that placement of that mid centering ring is. Page 54 in the handbook. Thank you, Connie. Um, that, that centering, that F centering ring, well, where it's at, uh, as, so long as you have enough slack in the screws to... Uh... Yeah, and I think part of the confusion came in too, because at this point you were only supposed to have done the T nuts and not yeah. put the screws in. So I think we got a little ahead of ourselves, caused some confusion, but everyone should uh, be able to get their measurements good now, right? No questions about it. Yep. Yours looks phenomenal, Kevin. I try. Now that, that five quarter inch is, is gonna be measured from the forward part of that centering ring to the aft. Not the center of the ring, or not the aft part of the ring, but the forward part of the ring. I think that's where everybody's getting confused. Um, so I'm gonna do a time check that I am the gatekeeper of the time. So I do wanna make sure that um, we have enough time. We only have 15 minutes left in tonight's presentation. And I, I'm you know, conscious of where, where everybody is. So um, Frank, can we move to um, slide 25 and begin to work on this process? Yeah, do we want to make one last note about um, when you're fitting the fins into your um, fin slots, just be mindful that the fins may be different sizes. So don't over sand your fins because then you might have problems when you're trying to do it later when we're actually installing them with the epoxy. So just test them on a couple of fin slots, don't over sand them, um, but you can finish you know, fitting those later tonight. Okay, has so everybody got the motor mount tube in their hands? Yep. I want, I want you to yep. keep aft motor mount ring off and set it to the side. That's the one with the motor retention on it. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, dry fit step, fit the uh, mid centering ring at the measurement mark in the previous step. Then slide the ring down below the lines.
Okay, we're, we're the, if you get a good fit and a good measurement on the mid centering ring, let's start mixing some epoxy. Now what we wanna do, when we, when we apply the epoxy, we can do the forward centering, yes we are. I want you to apply the, the epoxy with, your, with the with the tube facing forward, that means with the eye bolt on top, because when you apply epoxy, epoxy runs a bit before it sets. So you wanna make sure that your motor mount tube is facing up forward with the eye bolt to the top. And you want your centering motor mount tube down at the bottom. So when you apply your epoxy on that mark on the centering ring, you want to push your centering ring up and kind of twist it a little bit to that mark so you have a good fillet bead on top. That way, when you let it sit up forward on its end, it won't drip. It'll just stay in contact with the uh, center motor mount ring and the motor mount tube to adhere. A reminder, now is a good time to put on some gloves so you don't yeah. get epoxy all over your hands. Oh, too late. No. Um. It is not easy to get off. So make sure you have your, uh, it, but if you do get um, some on your hands, remember that you can use alcohol to, um, to take care of that. Right. And then while you're in the process of doing your sending ring like that, I told you to push it down. Do the same thing to the forward ring. Push that down and remember where you marked it and apply glue on that mark too. And uh, Kevin, show them which way that motor mount should be when you glue it. Yep, with the eye bolt up. So once you apply it, slide the rings up and let the epoxy spread all over it. And you should only do, be doing one ring at a time. You shouldn't epoxy both and then try to do both rings. Make sure you do that, the, the mid-centering ring, and then do your forward ring. Yeah, do not epoxy the aft ring area at all, please. Just the, uh, the, the mid motor mount ring and the forward ring. And you really want to make sure that you don't get epoxy on the fin slots to affect the fins going in later. Well, it shouldn't affect it when they're going forward, but yeah, I know what you mean, dripping it on there, I get you. And once you get a nice bead of epoxy around it, then push your slide, your uh, motor mount ring up. And do the same thing for the top. And always watch your uncured epoxy when it's runny. It'll uh, it'll jump on you somewhere at some time. So be careful <laughs> or something. Yeah, really make sure to, when you're epoxying, have your have your alcohol nearby, paper towels, so that if something does drip or um, you get your hands get sticky, you can use that alcohol to to um, wipe it up right away before it cures. Kevin, are you, are you, are you all done? Working on it, almost there. Uh, were we gonna, we have everyone put a little dab of epoxy on the back side of their eye bolt at this point or do you wanna save that for tomorrow? That's yeah. on tonight. Yeah, I would put it on the uh, back side of the nut of the eye bolt and I would put it on the back side of your retention system on your T-nuts. Do not cover the holes of the T-nut when you apply epoxy. What you can do is screw the screw in as far as you can and you can actually coat the the whole, you can coat the whole T-nut with the screw in there, level, don't bottom, don't bottom it up, just level with the end of the 
tea nut and you can take the whole epoxy and just smear it all over that tea nut on the back side. Uh, epoxy does not adhere to metal. It sticks to metal, but, but it does not adhere to the metal. So once that cures, you should be able to turn those screws out and it'll kind of act like a little locking device on it. It'll be a little friction on there, but they'll come out and go back in. That's most important is to epoxy the, the back of those T-nuts, spread the epoxy on the metal part of the T-nut to the wood. So it's all one bond, so you can't back it off, supposedly. <laughs> I know. Is, is everybody almost done or completed or? Uh, Got the I'm first gonna, one. I'm gonna scan the uh, classrooms here. Elizabeth, how are you doing? I see, okay, you got to do, working on the forward one, right? Yep. Uh, Dr. Farrell, looks like you're working on the forward one. Good job. Dylan, how are you doing? I'm just making some epoxy for the forward one right now. Okay, great. Yeah, just only mix them enough epoxy for the uh, for the job. Like I say, it's only five minute epoxy. It it starts not setting up, but it becomes useless for uh, controlling the epoxy probably like in about three minutes. And when it says five minute epoxy, it means it sets up hard, but it's not cured. Don't go using five minute epoxy and then go fly your rocket right away. Uh, it's generally you got to have at least. 18 to 24 hours for the epoxy properly cure. They only do that on bad reality TV. Yeah. And Christmas trees. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I have a little bit of excess epoxy in, a, in the ring, like pushes it up. Should I try and remove that so it's not adding extra weight or is that not a significant enough deal? Uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're not really, uh, uh, the weight for this is not real crucial. Okay. Yeah, it's not too crucial. I mean, this rocket weighs uh, le less than two pounds, and it, that's, in my book, that's pretty light, real light. <laughs> so we are at 7.55. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and start with the review and, you know, what okay. we're going to do for tomorrow. Um, so as I'm doing that, what I'm asking, what I'd like everybody to do is take yourself off of mute because I'm going to be asking some questions and I'd love to hear the answers. And so you guys don't have to go back and forth if you know them. Um, I, have one, I have one quick, one question about the, uh, what you were saying about the T-nuts. I missed that because I was focusing on the rings. So you're epoxying the T-nuts in back. Yes, you want to make sure that you, you are. Uh, Kevin, uh, get on. Go sure, ahead, okay. Kevin. Yeah, you can take the screws off and just, you're just worrying about the T-nuts right now. Because mm -hmm. uh, the screws will kind of get into your way. So you're just going to place the dab of epoxy kind of on the edges of the T-nut, but don't block the hole at all. Great. Okay. That was my instinct. Just making sure. Okay. Uh, what what, you're doing. what I, was, I was saying, Daniel, I said you can put the screws in, flush with the backside, smear the epoxy over the whole backside of it because the epoxy will not stick to metal. I mean, it will not cure to metal. It won't adhere to metal, but it'll stick, but it'll come to the point where you can just screw it off. I just wanna make sure you get enough epoxy on the backside of that T-nut. That's, uh, so you smear the T-nut along with the, uh, uh, the wood also. Okay, so, um... Who can tell me what are the two types of rocket structures that we talked about tonight? Anybody, shout it out. Two types. Single and dual deploy. Excellent, you got it. Who is the manufacturer of your kit? My precision. Excellent. And what is the actual kit? Which, which model? <laughs> what was that? 
Caliber ISP. Yes, which will be important for the Roxim. Who can name the six phases of the single deploy flight profile? Uh, launch, coast, um, Apogee. Mm, Apogee is not one of them. The coasting flight is, the launch is, but we have launch. What's in between launch and coasting flight? Powered portion. Uh, That's close enough. That's power to send. stops. Yep. So we have launch, power descent, coasting flight. What's next? Uh, the Ejection. Drone deploy. Ejection charge. And then what do we have after that? Slow descent. Uh-huh. And what's our last one? Hopefully you can recover. Hopefully you can recover. Landing. That is on page 12 in your handbook in case you want to look at that afterwards. Um, what are the main parts of the rocket? So we have the end where the fin is. Fins are, what, what is that called? What section or what part? Our booster. Aft slash booster. And then the other end is? The nose and the sustainer. No sustainer, and if it's not aft, it's forward. Forward, excellent. So, um, what makes up the aft portion of the rocket? This is what you guys have been working on. Uh, well, motor mount. Yes. Motor mount. <laughs> yep, that's part of it. Uh, we're gonna have the. The the, uh, and uh, do you want like the centering rings, all that too, or just like with the uh, parachute and the cord and? So your recovery is going to be a part of that, yeah. correct? You've got the motor um, mount. What are we work? What have we been working on and had so many problems getting it into those slots? Uh, the fins. The fins in the airframe. Very good. So. Where is, and you guys should all know this because we went over it many times, where is the mid-centering ring located on the motor mount tube? The quarter. From that. Is Forward of the pin slot. Perfect. That was the answer I wanted. Excellent. And what is the purpose of sanding all of your rocket components? To allow the um, epoxy to adhere to it. Yeah, that's true too. Yep, to allow the epoxy to adhere and to make sure that we have a good fit between pieces. Um, very good, those were my questions. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So between tonight and tomorrow morning, when you jump on before 10 a.m., uh, remember you wanna complete those um, pre-fit checks. So things that, you need to complete yet would be your nose cone sanding, your um, fins if they're not fitting properly into the um, into the fin slots. You once you have that epoxy completed, leave your motor motor mount aside so it will dry properly, because we need that dry for in the morning. Uh, review your handbook for tomorrow morning. Kind of look over what we're going to be going through, um, and then as I said earlier. Remember, to be early is on time and to be on time is late. Make sure you have water, make sure you have snacks and you're ready to go for the day. Team, is there anything you wanna add? Yep, if you need um, to access the presentation and just make sure that you've gone through the first you know, 28 slides fully, um, the presentation is on the Student Tools and Tips website under, I'm pretty sure it's just called WSGC Launch to Learn. So I put the link in the chat to, for you to get to the tools and tips. Um, the schedule is there, the presentation is there, and the handbook, virtual version of it. So just make sure that tomorrow morning when we start, you are all caught up and ready to go. And do not, let me repeat, do not move ahead thinking I know what I'm doing. We really want you to walk step by step with us through each step of the process so that we're here to make sure that we've got it all right. Because even when we've been in the room, somebody has gotten something wrong and we've had to go back and 
help them. So really want you guys to be successful so that you'll have a successful certification launch when we get to that point. Um, there, uh, we can stay on for just a couple more minutes. Um, I'd say maybe two or three, if somebody has a, a question, we'll be here. Otherwise, good night, everybody. Um, we can go ahead and stop recording and we will see you tomorrow morning. Who needs